Hello, everyone, and welcome to NJ Spotlight's latest uh, roundtable, uh, Back to School in New Jersey, What to Expect This Fall. Uh, and thank you very much for joining us at, th at this time. It's uh, obviously a busy part of the year for a lot of school folks. Um, so we really appreciate you being with us and, and uh, taking part in this conversation with us. I think it's going to be a really good one. Um, obviously, uh, you know, this is a somewhat of a speculative discussion because we don't really know what's going to be happening in the fall. Um, but what, one of the things I've learned in covering education in all these years is a lot of planning goes into every process. And uh, there's no doubt schools have been uh, deep in the weeds trying to figure out what they're going to be doing uh, going forward, certainly in the summer and, and, and now in the fall. And the Department of Education and the governor's office have been deep in the weeds figuring out the guidance that's going to contribute to that. Um, it is a very fluid situation, I've learned. And, and I've also learned early on, uh, tough to make predictions, um, at least accurate ones. Uh, but this at least, we, we hope this will give you a first-hand look at some of the folks who are making those uh, calls for their schools and, and for their own classrooms and for the state as a whole, and hopefully can help uh, advance the conversation a little bit. Um, as those who have joined our, our um, roundtables before, uh, we certainly welcome folks to submit questions and, and have conversations of their own. Um, we When folks signed up, a lot of uh, people submitted uh, great questions to us, and those will be woven into this discussion that we're about to be having. We also welcome folks to uh, get in the chat room in, in Vimeo, introduce yourselves, uh, share ideas, share resources. Uh, we really look forward to that being really part of the value of these roundtables. And this year we're going to do something a little different in that at the end, um, of roughly at 5 or 5.15 after the panel ends, we're going to keep that chat room open, and I'm going to stay on there and hopefully continue that conversation. If, if folks want to step up a little bit and, and offer some ideas that they've been doing in their schools, I will welcome that. Uh, I know um, at least one of our panelists will be joining us and, and can speak to her uh, experiences and feelings going forward. So please, uh, we'll be reminding you, but please you know, stick around and, and join that as well. Um, now, I, you know, there's, there's a couple of logistical things as well with social media. Uh, certainly join join in that conversation um, and you know I, we really look to this as being something that we continue afterwards and certainly uh, this will be we are going to be taping this it's all on the record we'll be taping it we'll be putting it up on our website and uh, certainly welcome folks to share that with those who couldn't join us um, and again keeping that conversation going online now uh, you know before we get going with the panel uh, I'd and, and I guess our opening remarks certainly uh, don't want to short trip them uh, with Governor Murphy. I want to say a few words about our sponsors. We could not be doing this without the support of our underwriters. Um, and we certainly could not be doing this for free. And, and I you know, I want to give a, a shout out to them and, and a big thank you to them and uh, introduce Steve Shallot, our business development director, to say a few words uh, before we get the show going. Steve? Thanks, John. I'm Steve Shallot. Business Development Director for NJ Spotlight News. It's my privilege to be the producer of today's event. As John mentioned, it wouldn't be possible to bring these events to the public free of charge without the gracious support of our sponsors, whom we would like to acknowledge with our thanks this afternoon. Firstly, NJEA. The New Jersey Education Association is a diverse, democratic organization that works to create an optimal environment for achieving excellence in public education in New Jersey. NJEA's mission is to advance and protect the rights, benefits, and interests of members and to promote an excellent system of public education for all students. NJEA promotes and delivers quality professional development for educators and advances and supports policies that enhance and enrich public education. So thank you to the NJEA. Next, we would like to thank Public Consulting Group. Public Consulting Group, or PCG, is a mission-driven company that works exclusively for public agencies and nonprofit organizations across the domains of education, health, and human services. This year marks PCG's 35th year in business, providing solutions that matter around the world. PCG's education practice provides technology, professional development, and consulting services, and it serves each New Jersey school district in at least one way whether it's 
modernizing the way data is collected to guide improvement in schools and alleviate the administrative burden of statewide, or generating over $1 billion in Medicaid reimbursement to sustain critical health services to special education students and conducting special education program reviews, or providing web-based tools and supports to understand student needs, develop personalized learning plans, and monitor progress. As we emerge from the pandemic, educators, administrators, and families are seeking ways to evaluate individual student needs, identify students who are at risk, and develop plans to accelerate learning and development. PCG can help. To learn more, please visit edplan.com. That's E-D-P-L-A-N.com. We'd like also to thank New Jersey Children's Foundation. The New Jersey Children's Foundation is a Newark-based, not-for-profit, focusing on breaking down the walls of inequity by investing in local initiatives, building partnerships, and supporting fact-based information sharing. Serving as one of Newark's anchor institutions, NJCF is a leader and an advocate in supporting high-quality public education systems that put the interests of children first. Learn more about the New Jersey Children's Foundation's work at www.njchildren.org. And finally, we'd like to thank the New Jersey Principals and Supervisors Association. The NJPSA provides numerous membership professional services to nearly 6,700 principals, assistant principals, supervisors, directors, and other school district leaders. It is dedicated to the promotion of educational excellence via government advocacy, legal assistance, leadership programs, professional learning, and retirement counseling. Through its professional learning division, the Foundation for Educational Administration, the association offers its members educational, leadership, and legal training opportunities on a multitude of timely and relevant topics. Sincere thanks again to our sponsors. And with that, I'd like to turn it back over to John Mooney to begin our program. Thank you very much. John? Great. Steve, thank you very much. And, and again, uh, big thanks to all of our uh, sponsors for this, because um, this is, I think, our fifth uh, roundtable around schools since the pandemic started. Uh, we've gotten a wonderful uh, response from the audience as well. And, and uh, as I said, we couldn't do it without that support. So thank you very much. OK, well, let's get going. Um, we're going to start with a few words. Um, I had a chance to sit down with Governor Murphy, sit down virtually uh, with Governor Murphy last week. Uh, to talk a little bit about school reopening and what his vision uh, is for schools going forward. Um, you know, it, it was, you know, a, a, a good blueprint. Admittedly, a couple things have happened since then, and we're going to hopefully can catch up off of it. Uh, but I, I very much appreciate the governor taking the time. So let's roll, roll that interview, and then we'll come back and uh, have a conversation among our educators. Welcome, uh, Governor. Thank you very much for joining us uh, today. Looking forward to our conversation. Um, as you know, um, we're doing this before a, a panel that we're uh, we're hosting a NJ Spotlight News panel. We're hosting around uh, what schools will look like in September of 2021. Uh, at that point, uh, a good 16, 17, uh, 18 months since the pandemic began, and, and really the first reopening of, uh, on a on a wide scale since the beginning of all this. Um, and you know, in the last 15 months, we've certainly gotten a, a sense of, of the state's role in, in managing this, and especially around schools. I mean, uh, you played a very prominent role and and helped navigate what has been uh, clearly a really challenging time. And I, let me start with a broad question: uh, What is your vision for schools in, in September in New Jersey? I think, John. First of all, it's good good to be with you, um, and good luck with the panel that will follow this conversation. Um, I hope as close to normal as possible. People ask me, for instance, uh, do you think we'll be able to be mask free? And my answer is I hope so. Uh, but the good news is we've got time on the clock. Um, last summer, the Department of Education put out a you know, a pretty thick document, the road back, I think it was called. Uh, my guess is they'll do the same this summer, but we tweaked it over the course of the summer. But I think we're going to be, John, in a dramatically different and better place than we were last September, certainly, and I think even uh, dramatically better than we are right now. Remember last year, uh, we knew the possibility of a second wave was extremely high, and we had no vaccines. 
and we knew the public health guidelines worked, social distancing, masking, you know, all the good work that schools did up and down the state. You know, we're, you know, we're in a dramatically different place now. We're going to achieve, I hope, in the next number of days, if not by the time this airs, uh, the, the objective to get 4.7 million adults vaccinated um, fully in New Jersey. Uh, and our numbers are dramatically better as a result. I do think, you know, a couple of wild cards. You know, could there be a third wave? I suppose there could be. This Delta variant out of India uh, is clearly more contagious or more transmissible, and it, it hits you harder, although the, the vaccines look like they work well against it, thankfully. I'd love to see vaccines that are approved by the federal government for kids under the age of 12. Uh, we don't have that as we sit here. Uh, those you know, those would be two wild cards that we'll, we'll be watching. But, John, I hope this is as close to normal as possible, five days a week, all in school, extracurricular sports, uh, on masking. I'm hoping we don't need to wear them. Uh, that's one I think we can we can allow the time on the clock to, to be our friend here over the course of the summer. Uh, but I, I'd say the word I would use would be normal. So we're, we're talking about the current rule is that they be masked. Unless there's a unless there's an, a, a potential to impair their health, which includes high heat, and we've only got another week or so at most for most districts in the state, so that's that is relevant for the next week. Uh, but that's uh, that's the only the only caveat at the moment. And then, um, and then in terms of distancing, do you see um, you know even in in when we we're not all vaccinated. Uh, you know, in, in the fall, do you see it staying at three feet? Uh, do you see it going down? I mean, there's some questions around that uh, in terms of the state's guidance on that. Do you, do you have a sense of that at this point? Too early, John, to be definitive, but that will go down. The only question is, is it down on Labor Day? Uh, it's a little similar to masking. These things are all, my, my based on, listen, I'm not a scientist or a medical expert. Uh, I'm relying on, on, conversations uh, measured now in the hundreds with those who are, I personally think, John, this ends up uh, being like the flu over time, that it's with us. Um, it, it's in our midst, but it does not prevent us from living our normal lives, getting back to complete normalcy. Exactly how and when, too early to tell, but that's the direction clearly that we're headed, including on social distancing. Uh, there, um, and I'm sure you've heard, heard this more directly than from me, but, um, you know, the, the sooner the guidance to districts, the more easily they can plan for this stuff, especially if we're talking no, space. No, no, some no question. And social hold. distancing, yeah, and social distancing, things that take a lot of work, HVAC upgrades, uh, social distancing, not quite at the same level of HVAC, but still requires partitions. You can't. Unlike masking, where you could literally say Sunday night at five o'clock tomorrow morning, you don't need to wear a mask, folks need a runway, which I completely understand and get, which is why we tried our best to put the guidance out last June, and I suspect we'll do the same uh, sooner than later. But we're all, we're, you know, the virus continues to dictate, dictate the terms here, so we're going to have to reserve the right to tweak this over the course of the summer, depending on which way we go, including, I hope, for the positive. You, um... Speaking of instruction, as you said, it would be all in, in person. Um, will there be, other than for, for health reasons, will there be any exceptions? If, if there are families that are uncomfortable coming back, uh, if everyone's not vaccinated, or uh, situations where somebody has to quarantine, um, you know, especially if we're talking about international students as well, I mean, is there going to be a mix of virtual in there? Um, you know, or, or are you absolute on five days a week? you know, 180 days a year, six hours yep. a day. So John, I'm a lot closer to absolute than I am to the word flexible, but that does not mean that we're gonna put anybody's life at risk. We never have. I mean, New Jersey's got the number one rated uh, public education system in America. Uh, and part of that is the care that we take after our own, our kids, our educators, our and their families. So we'll put somebody in harm's way. We're gonna have to have some level of latitude for, for, for folks who, who have extreme health, but I would say the bar, health uh, ex concerns, the bar will be very high. Uh, and again, 
so to be determined exactly what that looks like. No, so, being uncomfortable with being, so being an uncomfortable in school without everyone vaccinated, that is that doesn't fall under it? Yeah, I, I don't see that as being a, a cause for, for a, a different option, no. Being uncomfortable is, is not in the same category as uh, we're putting a kid's life at risk or an educator's life at risk or a staff member's life at risk. Do you see the use of, I mean, we obviously virtually every, well, not virtually every district had to be remote uh, for a certain period of time, and, and many of them stayed at least somewhat remote uh, to this day. Do you see that virtual learning become uh, becoming part of schooling uh, in ways that obviously we weren't thinking about back when? I mean, it, you know, in terms of not so much out of necessity, but out of, you know, good education. Uh, you know, we, we spent a lot of money on closing the divide as best as that's defined. Um, you know, is schooling going to be a different kind of schooling uh, in September, or do you wish it to be? What's your vision of that? I mean, p potentially, John, at, at the margins. I mean, one of the – there's no such a thing as a silver lining when, when over 26,000 people have died in our state. But in the, in the spirit of trying to find optimism out of this tragedy, among others uh, – you know, we had a persistent, and you, you've written about this and, and spoken about it, a persistent and longstanding digital divide that disadvantaged uh, particularly communities of color, um, underprivileged kids, rural kids. We closed that, uh, and I'm proud of that. It was 231,000, I think, kids as of August of 2020. We brought it to zero. Um, that does allow us without question, you know, could you see somebody in a tutoring session after school or a parent teacher conversation uh, or a meetup of a team or the drama club? I think on the margins, it probably does give us a leg up in flexibility, uh, not just the closing of the divide, but the habits that we've all developed. But I don't think there's any, um, there's, there's, there, I don't think there's any uh, replacement for the richness that, that kids get, that educators get from being in person for the main body of their education. And that's what you're aiming for. Let me ask, uh, in the time we have left, um, the, obviously a lot of money is coming into school districts uh, in terms of federal money, uh, pandemic relief and, and addressing some of the main issues, including technology, um, but you know, lots of issues on the table. Um, what do you, I know that you're leaving it to local districts to determine, and there are some parameters, but what do you hope the bulk of that money is used for in terms of our schools? I mean, there's, you know, um, a, a myriad of challenges, and, and there were a myriad of challenges before the pandemic. Um, and, this, yep. and this does provide a, you know, a restart of sorts, as, as Secretary Cardona yep. said. You know, what do you, you know, if, if you had your druthers, where would you like the bulk of this money going to? Yeah, John, a couple of things. Um, for all in terms of timing, as we sit here, as this is airing, we're still in the midst of getting our budget over the goal line, uh, which is our first priority. And then we will turn, we've had great uh, exchanges and cooperation and spirit of teamwork from our legislative uh, colleagues. Uh, we will turn, I think, really then to laying out how that American Rescue Plan money will be put to work over the next, you know, we're allowed to do that over a three-year period. We want to do it the right way, responsibly. In the past, uh, New Jersey has uh, set the bar for, you know, using one-time monies to fill up operating budget holes, et cetera. We don't want to go near that. So, and, and the legislative leadership has been, to their credit, equally as passionate. But I'll give you three areas, John, that come, you know, I suspect there are a lot more than three, but three areas in particular that come to mind. One is the explicit um, uh, physical plant investment to make sure that an HVAC systems are the, you know, the best example of this, that we have world-class ventilation and related realities in our school buildings. That's an example of a lot of different capital stuff, but that to me is, the, is a whole category of very COVID specific Secondly, would be learning loss. Um, we've already thrown a significant amount of money at that. Uh, we need to acknowledge, and I think we all do, that there has been substantial learning loss, again, particularly 
uh, in, in districts that have a disproportionate uh, black and brown uh, 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 en enrollment. Um, and so all the stuff that you'd associate with learning loss, direct one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, tutoring time, after school, summer programs, frankly, professional development for our educators to allow them to have tools that they, they wouldn't have necessarily already had in their toolbox. Um, that's a second, another category, a third category, and I'll, I'll stop at three. Mm -hmm. And we've already, again, put some resources toward this, but we need to put more at it, and that's mental health, uh, both for the kids, uh, the educators, staff, and families. Um, and, and acknowledging again the fact that this has been extraordinary, extraordinarily stressful. I've had a lot of moms and dads walk up to me and say, listen, the masking thing isn't that I don't agree with you on the science. I just want to say that it's become a real burden psychologically for my kid. And I get that completely. And that's one example of a, of a much broader field of challenges, just the loneliness of being in front of a screen like you and I are right now uh, from month after month after month. Forget forget about on the one hand, if there was learning loss, it's just the, the fact that, you know, we've been living in isolation. Uh, so those are some examples. Looking forward to working with the districts and with the legislature and and, uh, and putting this to the very best use uh, possible. Last word, um, you know, looking, looking back or looking forward and, and then looking back, uh, on on this last year, what do you think going into the next year, where, as you say, hopefully is as normal as possible, what do you think the biggest lesson of this last year has been for schools? Well, I, I don't know if there's one, John. I think on the positive side, courage, persistence, uh, incredible dedication by kids, educators, staff, moms and dads, superintendents, everybody in the educational communities. I mean, really heroic examples up and down the state in both the public districts, obviously overwhelmingly, that's where most of our kids are, but in fairness, in religious and, and private and other schools. I think the big takeaways are the ones we just talked about in terms of where I think money has to go. We have to acknowledge learning loss with the number one public education in America. Uh, it matters uh, dearly to us and our next generation of, of, uh, of our New Jersey family. Uh, learning loss, the mental health challenges, acknowledging them and, and approaching them with the right resources in the right way. Um, would I have still shut schools as we did uh, in mid-March of 2020? Uh, there's no question that was the, the choice we had, particularly given how little we knew about what was hitting us. That's one, you you know, in a perfect world, you'd love to think that you wouldn't have had to do that. There's no way that that was an option. Uh, but I think those are some of the some of the lessons, good and challenging, that I, I take away from this. And I think, lastly, that we will recover, that we will recover. That, that same courage, persistence, heroism in some cases, incredible hard work, all of that will also contribute mightily to our getting back on our feet and making up for that learning loss and pushing back smartly against the mental health challenges that have come from it. Would you have done anything differently with schools uh, in terms of yeah. over the course of the last year? I guess I'd have one more question. But I mean, it's, that, that's a big question. I mean, I, uh, we, will, we will do a complete, as I've promised, uh, a political postmortem on everything we did, um, but the big one was shutting down. And the answer is no. I wouldn't have done that differently. That's that's uh, the, the, that that was the only option we had. I really appreciate you taking the time, Governor. Uh, we will follow this up with our own panel. But you've been great. Thank you. Thanks, man. Take care of yourself. Good luck with the panel. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, that actually worked out, and and I am I. You may notice I'm wearing the same shirt. I have cleaned it in between the two interviews. Uh, it was uh, I, I tried to match it as close as I could, and so um, and actually pretty close. So feeling good about that. So let's uh, get the conversation going. I'd like to introduce our panelists and and pose a few questions to them. But hopefully this will be a great conversation uh, among them as well as as the audience as well. I'd, uh, first off, David Adderhold, uh, the superintendent of West Windsor Plainsboro 
schools in Mercer County and, and it's been pretty outspoken on some of the issues um, you know, surrounding reopening and, and guidance. And uh, we welcome you. Thank you very much, David, for joining us. Uh, Lisa, Lisa Gleason, uh, the Assistant uh, Commissioner of the Department of Education, um, heads up the academic and, and assessment programs for the state and uh, has really been the point person on a lot of these issues for the commissioner and, and the Murphy administration in general. Um, I'm happy to introduce the New Jersey Principal of the Year, and that's uh, Kwame Morris. Uh, thank you. It's a the principal of uh, Cherry, Hi Cherry Hill High School West, I think, is, am I right on that? Uh, and thank you very much for joining us. Great to have you on board. And last but not least, a uh, repeat performer for NJ Spotlight Roundtable, uh, Chantel Wooden, a uh, sixth grade teacher at the Joyce Kilmer uh, School in, uh, sixth grade language arts teacher at the Joyce Kilmer School in Trenton. Uh, she also was one on one of our first panels a year ago, uh, focusing on remote education, and was so good that we invited her back to uh, join us today. And uh, I, let's go straight to the teacher. Um, you're going to be the front line on this. We actually had a question. We got a lot of wonderful questions from folks, and one of them was, "What are you know for the panelists? What are you going to do on the first day? What is your priority on the first day in September, whatever date that's uh, determined?" But as a teacher, as a you, you will be their their first day of schooling. Um, talk a little bit about that first day and what do you expect of that? So um, we at our school, we live by the motto of, uh, from my principal, you know, start the way you want to finish. So because we started in a remote environment this year, I had a party my first day of school. So I think when the kids come back in person, I'm going to have another party. It's going to be live this time. So I'm starting with a party. I'll end the school year with a party and I'm starting the way I want to finish. Why don't we uh, go next? We'll we'll uh, go next to the principal in in the uh, discussion. Um, Kwame, what's what's your first what's your first day going to look like? Yeah, I think for us uh, here administratively at the school, I think this this, this the idea of reacclimation uh, when we consider the fact that uh, I guess only our senior class uh, will have spent a full year. In school with us, you know, it's this idea that we need to reacclimate um, so many of our classes back to what it means to be in school on a daily basis. So I think, you know, that's that's our our primary focus, um, as well as a couple of the things that the the governor mentioned, um, assessing the amount of learning loss if there's any, um, as well as assessing any type of SEL or social emotional learning needs that that our students have as well. David, David Adderall from West Windsor Plainsboro. Uh, what's what's that school district going to look like on that day and likely September at this point? Welcome back over 9,500 students on that day. There's going to be a lot of permission given to to spend time, as Kwame said, reacclimating, building relationships with our students. Um, and, and his point's really well taken. You know, I, we think about our school structures and think about the amount of transitions that occur within them and that there's not a lot of students at any grade level that's spent any significant amount of time in that building. Um, so we're gonna really need to spend, be very mindful about a purposeful reopening and, and giving time for students and staff to get reacclimated. How do you do that? I mean, is, is this set up in schedules? Or is it, I mean, I imagine there's gonna be a few convocation meetings beforehand with faculty, but you know, let's, let's start talking specifics. How do you, how do you reacclimate you know, 1.2 million kids who spent a good chunk of their last school year in their kitchen staring at a computer. David, you, you, you don't follow up on that. Yeah, John, I think I think when we talk about it, I mean, it's it's tough to do that. Um, it's going to be a challenge, and it's tough to do that in the face of um, standardized assessments starting two weeks in. So, you know, we're going to be in a position where we really need to uh, make sure that this that as much as we're concerned about learning loss that we're being mindful to give staff, teachers in particular, permission to build relationships with their students instead of diving directly into content. And as much as content's important, as much as you know, assessing learning loss is, or uh, the learning needs of our students is going to be evident and going to be a focus point, um, we do need to get grant permission um, in order to just spend time to hold that party uh, that Ms. Wooden talked about. Lisa Gleason, you you have the unenviable task of 
trying to figure this out for a whole state, uh, or at least uh, try to provide some some guidance. Um, what would you like those first days to look like? Uh, I mean, certainly um, there's also, and I'd like to follow up with questions about so-called learning loss, if that's the right term for it. Uh, but you know, let's start with that first day, that first week. Um, you know, if you could write guidance for specifically Monday to Friday, you know, talk a little bit about what you'd like to see. Thank you, John. And I would echo uh, the voices of, of my fellow panelists here. Uh, the party to welcome our students back, our 1.4 million students across the state, our staff and ed educators returning back on site. Um, and to Dr. Adderhold's point, to make sure that our focus is on the social and emotional needs of our students and our staff first, before we can really move to content and teaching and learning, that we have to really think about uh, school as a safe place and the transition back to, um, for many of our students and staff, facilities that they may not have seen in 15 months or longer and um, how to create that safe space again for them so that we can get back to uh, what will be a new normal, not the, the return to normal or business as usual. So uh, an absolute emphasis on uh, social and emotional so resources and supports that are in place. And certainly at the Department of Education, we are feverishly working on the types of meaningful supports and guidance that our districts need to help support that uh, return of our students and staff to uh, back to our, our uh, campuses across the state. Let me quickly ask you while I can, um, is there a timetable at all on that guidance uh, for the educators in this uh, panel? Do you have a rough, the governor said coming soon, and I know you obviously, sooner the better for schools, um, given the amount of planning that goes into it. Do you have a this week, next week, tomorrow, anything you can tell us, Lisa? Well, we, we certainly recognize that um, the guidance is, is um, uh, awaited uh, and anticipated, and, and we have been providing supports and resources. Uh, we recently released the uh, summer, I'm sorry, the summer resource learning guide, as well as a district self-assessment readiness uh, checklist sort of to reflect upon the continuum of readiness across four main areas of reopening. But we are, as I said, actively working on larger pieces of guidance. I do not have a, um, a specific date for release, but trust me that we are actively working on that guidance to release two districts. Let me stay with you, um, and then I certainly want to hear this from the educators on this, this issue of learning loss. And, and you've all talked about trying to create a very um, welcoming and uh, safe place for kids to return to uh, with a lot of attention towards their social and emotional well-being. But there's also this prevailing question of, of where are we with our kids um, and, and in their education? Um, Lisa, let me start with you. How do you balance both you know, creating one and then assessing as well at the same time? Um, as uh, David mentioned, um, there's going to be an assessment uh, given in, in every district for a uh, you know, vast majority of kids, a somewhat shortened version of, of the, uh, the state's uh, student learning assessment uh, called the Start Strong Assessment. Um, that will be given in September and October. But how do you balance the two where you're creating, you know, a, a safe space for what's been a pretty traumatic uh, year, uh, as well as getting on to the, you know, the job of educating? Lisa, do you want to go for that first? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, John. Well, as I've said, we, we know that our primary focus uh, must be on supporting our students' social and emotional well-being first. Until we tend to that, uh, we, we can't move to the academic piece. Uh, we know that our educators have done an extraordinary job over the past year uh, standing up systems and new ways of teaching that support their students' social and emotional well-being as well as their academic progress. Uh, we have tried to consider that primary focus of social emotional sort of level setting first uh, before we begin assessing uh, students' readiness with the Start Strong assessments in the fall. As you mentioned, the assessment window will be uh, from mid-September through uh, approximately the third week in October, which allows districts some flexibility around when they want to administer those shortened assessments. And 
And those assessments are an opportunity for all of our districts to assess where students are with regard to the uh, primary focus standards from the prior grade level, sort of a, a baseline before they begin the uh, upcoming school year. We also know that the Department of Education recently re released the results of the spring interim assessment data collection, which was self-reported de uh, data from districts across the state. Um, and it illustrated concerning instances of learning gaps throughout various grade levels and content areas. So um, while we are absolutely attending to uh, mental health and wellness and will continue, not just at the beginning of the year, but throughout the year, help our districts support their students and educators, we do know that we have to also have a lens on providing the supports for districts to focus on learning acceleration. And, and let me just define when I say learning acceleration, um, not meaning hurriedly rushing students through instruction to catch up, but rather examining and, and improving every component of the instructional cycle. Our districts really need to make sure that they have the supports in place so that our educators have a deep understanding of the learning standards. Uh, they have an, a, a deep understanding of the types of high quality lessons that uh, must be in place with scaffolding, depth of instruction, and really robust progress monitoring now more than ever so that we can see where students are across the continuum of learning. And we know that across the state and varying dis district by district, those gaps are going to look very different district by district. Chantel, you're the teacher on the panel. Um, how much, you know, weighing both of the, you know, and they're not distinct things, certainly social emotional health has a lot to do with instructional health as well. And I, I certainly understand that. But as a teacher, are these, um, are you going to be clamoring for information like that these assessments are going to provide you? You know, how are you sort of going to gauge yourself as a teacher how to how to proceed with the instructional piece of your job? An educator, yes, we all have to be concerned with, you know, those standards because we're graded as well, you know, as, te as uh, students are. We get a report card at the end of the year just like them. Uh, so, yes, that is my concern, but my, my concern is more so the student per se, um, you know, them as a human being, them, their social and emotional. You know, I've had some really good mentors, you know, in education, uh, as well as some wonderful principals who always really made me hone in on the social, social emotional um, well-being of the student as a person first before assessing their, you know, knowledge and their skills. So that kind of thing is just going to come natural to me because I've been doing it, um, you know, in person as well as virtual. Uh, you know, assessing social emotional. That's why, you know, in the beginning of the year, I do fun things. I start out with poetry, um, you know, to get them into the like of, uh, of writing. Um, I read to them every day from September to June to get them into, you know, uh, the love of reading. So starting out with a party, I mean, it was very successful in a virtual sense. Um, I did do it, you know, in, in, in the classroom, not on the first day of school, but perhaps couple days afterwards and it just works it just works for me um because they get to see that yes Ms. Wooten is you know you know a staunch educator and I'm really strict in you know in, in getting things done however I also love to have fun I'm also a sixth grader at heart so that that helps with me getting to know them a lot better than assessing them and seeing you know what they can do on paper because there's so much more than what they what I see on paper uh, sorry to interrupt. As a teacher, um, Chantal, do you think that there has been learning loss or learning delay or learning disruption? You see these kids every day. Uh, it's Learning loss has become the big term. Is that I know, accurate? and I'm not partial to that term at all. I'm so not partial to that term. Um, it, it's it's kind of, you know, um, odd to say, but learning loss, well, I don't even want to say that the, the loss of of learning has been happening way before the pandemic. Um, so I don't want to blame it on the pandemic. Uh, you know, summertime is a time when students don't, don't you know, you know, don't immerse themselves in, in reading or writing or math, or arithmetic or anything like that. So um, they lose something anyway before the pandemic. Uh, so I'm a 
you know, an advocate for, you know, year round schooling. So if that happens, yay, you know, it, it, it works in other countries and other parts of the world. It, it works. We needed to do that in America a long time ago. <laughs> um, so I'm hoping it happens, you know, where it's, it, it doesn't have to look like it's uh, school all year round. You can have a break three weeks, a break two weeks, on a week, off a week. You know, it can look different and it can be creative. So I don't, yeah, I'm not going to use the term learning loss. I'm going to, uh, you know, try to come up with another term myself, you know, and, and just educate them all year round. Kwame, Kwame, your, your high school, uh, we actually had a couple of questions that were raised. Are kids entering ninth grade, which is, and I, I remember, I sadly remember it well, is, you know, one of the more anxiety ridden periods of my life is going to a new high school. Um, and whether there'll be additional supports for your incoming ninth graders, which uh, I'm curious on that. But are you worried that your kids are coming, you know, a bit traumatized and, and having lost some ground or at least not gained any ground over the last year? Yeah, you know what? Uh, great question. Definitely great question. I think my response to that is a layered one. Um, yes, yes. To answer your question, yes, I, I, I am. There is a bit of anxiety about what students, uh, what needs the students may have. Uh, I'm optimistic in the sense that I know that my my staff here and the, and the staff here in Cherry Hill is adaptable and uh, flexible, and they they've demonstrated themselves capable of knowing exactly what to do. Uh, to support our kids and, and to help them learn and grow. Uh, there's also another aspect of my thoughts that say that while there has been less time on task and, and, and less opportunity to be in school face to face, to face eyeball to eyeball with our teachers, there are other skills that I believe are intangible skills that individuals need for, for life that our students have been forced to, uh, to learn. Um, this idea of resiliency and resourcefulness and um, the ability to uh, to navigate a virtual world, uh, you know, many of the jobs that exist today are jobs that didn't exist ten years ago, you know, and I'm sure it, they will continue to evolve over the next ten years. So I think some of the skills that the, that the kids have learned as a result of what we've gone through um, will bode well for them in the future. Uh, but I, you know, I'll, I'll take students being in school in class, eyeball to eyeball with us any day um, over them not being um, in school with us. And you know, to, to, to answer your question about our ninth graders, we absolutely will be looking to do uh, ninth grade transitional activities this summer. Uh, in fact, we'll be involving our rising 10th graders into those transitional activities as well. It was, it was somewhat odd. I, I recall when we opened back up and allowed our ninth grade students to come back in, typically by January, February, they know the lay of the land, they know the building. It was, it was odd for me to see kids in February getting lost throughout the building. They didn't, they didn't know where to go because they hadn't been in school. So I think that that just uh, reflects what this year is, has been. David, I wanted to uh, talk to you about you know, one of the comments that the governor made. I asked him, do you see school, you know, what, what is your vision for schools in September? And, and he said, you know, as normal as possible. And uh, the notion of normal has been upended a few times over uh, over the last 16 years. So I'm not even sure what normal is anymore. But I do remember what it was like before the pandemic. Um, do you see schools being, um, you know, terribly different starting in September than they were? I guess it would have been two two Septembers ago. I mean, what is what is normal uh, for you, or what is the new normal for you, and what do you aspire it to be for your schools? Yeah, John, it's a it's a complicated question, and I, and I, I appreciate it. I mean, it, if we try to recreate September 2019, uh, I, I don't think it's fair to our educators, our students, or our families, and I think it's an unrealistic expectation that we're going to take 16 months of pandemic instruction and translate it back to normal. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I think a lot about the term learning loss, and I just think it's an unfortunate term. I think the indication of the only way you uh, overcome learning loss is to somehow catch up. And by catching up, you might double down and speed through content versus prioritizing the curriculum outcomes that matter most and talk about deep and meaningful learning. 
And so and I, I agree a lot with what, what Lisa said in, in her comments around uh, the term and how we have to think about the opening. Um, and so the idea of normal, I don't know what that means anymore. But what, what I know is I have, as I have my students and staff returning in September, um, and we're going to uh, work diligently to make sure that our staff feels comfortable, prepared, and trained to welcome our students back um, into classroom instruction and be prepared for any potential outcome and transition that I think we may be finding ourselves in. And so I'm, I'm not someone that thinks that um, we're out of the woods yet. Will that classroom look differently from your perspective? I mean, we've done a lot with technology in the last year and become somewhat of a one-to-one -one state, uh, as is much it's, of the country. You know, is that yeah, going to change the way teachers interact with um, students? It, it, it definitely changes how staff interact with students because um, as long as social distancing remains within the classroom, um, you have a more you know, gross structure um, environment, especially as you're going to full capacity. Um, many of us still allowed some form of virtual or hybrid instruction where you had students accessing virtually. So as you move to classrooms of 24, 27 plus, um, the only way to socially distance, even at three feet, is going to be rows and keeping separation. So this idea of small group work is going to be difficult. And so it's going to be a pullback from what our staff have utilized in, in prior techniques in the way that they're going to have some connection, I believe, is going to be using some of the digital tools in an in-class environment. So we're going to have to be very creative and continue to professional develop our staff throughout. We got a question uh, from the audience, I think, in the chat room. Uh, will schedules be different? Are kids still changing classes? Uh, I know that this social distancing is relevant, especially to school transportation and, and cafeteria and the like. What are you planning for right now? And, and Obviously, things could change and, and likely will. But what are you at least planning for now, David? And John, was that was that to me? Um, yes. So yeah. I, I would tell you that we're in, we're anticipating um, the return of our schedule for like the nineteen twenty school year. Um, but we were very mindful that um, we have to be prepared to I hate the term, but prepared to pivot. So when we first went into the twenty twenty one school year, uh, our structures were not um, at every grade level wasn't easily able to switch to either full day or to um, we ended up with a, a virtual afternoon uh, students went home for lunch uh, we were open from september on for those that wanted it and virtual for everyone else um, but when we when we came back in april and everyone came in um, we did struggle with all the structures and support mechanisms of otpt speech um, you know the way in which electives are scheduled that was not necessarily pivotable without rebuilding the entire schedule. So we've changed the way in which we thought about that. And we've had scheduling committees going since February in order to make sure that the schedules we built that are in the process of being built or are already completed um, can absorb changes that if we get a rise in, in a variant and we are told to, to move to virtual instruction, that we have a schedule that can do that. Lisa Gleason, how much is the state going to be weighing in on, on some of the best practices around this? Um, and what do you hope for? I mean, one of the things that you know must have been said as many times as the word pivot over the last uh, 16 months is the no notion that this is a restart. We can you know come back and learn our lessons and try to do some things differently. Uh, U.S. Secretary of Education just a couple weeks ago called this a restart button. Uh, of sorts and looking at the notion of seat time and and how we provide classes you know from the state's perspective are are these innovations uh part of the mix or is it getting back to you know as, as normal as we can uh talk about that balance a little bit sure uh, and i would absolutely echo uh, david's sentiments in that we can't go back to uh business as usual and there is uh, not a return to quote unquote normal uh what does the new normal look like well certainly um the pandemic uh, incredibly challenging. We know this for educators, students, parents, our school communities. Uh, but perhaps there are opportunities for us to re-envision um, minimally how instructional technology can be used in the classroom to maximize student engagement and maybe promote even higher levels of learning that we've had before. Um, we know that, uh, again, 
depending on where we are in real time in September, that um, we will we don't know how students will be spaced and how classrooms will be set up at this moment in time. But we do know that educators really honed their skills in educational technology for instructional deliveries. We've collected a clearinghouse of best practices that are featured on the Department of Education's website um, in a variety of areas, um, student learning activities, assessment, instructional delivery methods. So I think that when students return to in-person instruction in the fall, we'll see teachers really evaluating which of those technologies um, were most meaningful and continue to be most meaningful and, um, and which can help uh, create similar structures that were in place. Like David mentioned, um, if students are in rows, how can we simulate small group instruction, which is really, really important for our students. Um, uh, and, and technology may be the answer. We know we have great assessment technologies like Pear Deck and Flipgrid and Kahoot and others that are great formative assessment methods that students really enjoy. I would anticipate we'll still see a lot of that. Uh, Google Classroom was a uh, really frequently used platform and other learning platforms for independent learning activities. Um, and perhaps we'll see more of those kinds of platforms for small group instruction in a um, within the classroom, but still within a digital setting. Uh, we're really, you know, our teachers are incredibly innovative, incredibly perseverant. They, they've persevered through um, this challenging situation. We've, we've seen some really successful practices and, and real innovation. So I'm sure we'll continue to see those kinds of, uh, of practices as we move into the fall. And hopefully as conditions improve, we'll see a, a balance of um, some of the practices that we've used before that we know are really important for teaching and learning and that in-person instruction that we know is important for relationships and um, for attending to the needs of students, but also capitalizing on the digital resources that we found to be um, also uh, appropriate. We also know that with federal funding, we, we currently have a funding source, that districts have a funding source as well, to be thinking about what are the unique type of resources that are needed in their school communities um, and how can we, they use those funds to allocate resources uh, to target the kinds of interventions and um, high quality instructional resources to accelerate instruction and to, to I think more import importantly, to personalize learning and assess where students are when they return. Chantel, are you going to, how much use of technology, I don't know how much you used before the pandemic, you obviously used it quite a bit during, uh, how much is that going to be retained in your classroom come September? Oh, highly retained. I'm sure across the state, everyone is probably going to, uh, you know, continue to use what we, you know, works, um, continue to use what we've created. Uh, so I'm definitely going to, uh, continue with technology as I did before. However, I've learned a whole lot more, <laughs> uh, you know, since uh, the virtual world. I I've learned from my students a, a lot more than I learned from my colleagues. So um, I will continue to use my students as teachers as well. Yeah. Do you see them having their laptops or Chromebooks or, or uh, open in front of them in the classroom? um in the fall or i mean is it going to be like the textbook you know was for my generation uh, is, is it going to be a big part of their school supplies good question yes i i hope i i believe my school is going to continue with that definitely because it works so well for us um and if not i'm sure you know our, our, my principal will allow us to have the flexibility to do what works for us in, in a sense um to have that autonomy to choose. Uh, so, but for me, definitely, I will use that as a part of their, yeah, their a writing tool, uh, which I used, you know, all this year. But I'm still, you know, I'm from the old school. I still like per paper and pen. So I always had them, even though I taught, taught them virtually how to write and read and things. I'm like, get your notebook and your paper, get your uh, pen out, write this down. So I, I'm, I'm still from the old school. You know, I'm a 60s baby. I like paper and pen. Libraries also. Let me ask the two administrators, um, and it, this came up with the governor, and this is talking a little bit more on the operations and the health and safety. Do you expect, and I'll start with Kwame, 
uh, any of your families and or teachers who won't be comfortable coming back to school and you're going to have to navigate that. Um, you know, the governor was pretty, he didn't say 100% and certainly health and, you know, for, for medically fragile and, and health reasons, I think they've always been permitted to stay out of school and will continue to be. But for those who just aren't comfortable or, you know, and we're not everyone's vaccined at that point, um, you know, we're still going to be in a pretty fluid situation. You know, what are you, what are you envisioning uh, in, in terms of your community? Kwame, you can go first. Yeah, I absolutely would anticipate that, uh, you know, in the, in the community as large as ours, that there will be individuals who, who may be uncomfortable um, in coming back. And I think, you know, it's incumbent on us to, to try to create as safe um, and as comfortable environments as possible um, to give them some sense of reassurance that coming to, into the building is fine, um, that we are taking um, health, the hygiene and safety uh, with the highest regard and that our community is okay. You don't worry some no. tensions over that where they, that's still not enough. Um, and you know, especially if they're not, not vaccinated, which, you know, I guess there's some question whether that will be required or not. Um, you know, what, how, how are you going to navigate some of those tensions? Not trying to put you on the spot, but you are principal. No, you're here, not, you're so not you putting get... me on the spot at all because I'm already there. <laughs> we we are we're already dealing with uh, you know those those sort of issues. Uh, you know what? So I, I believe uh, um, it was mentioned earlier. You know this idea of relationships and, and trust and relationships, and I believe that extends from parents to the entire from students to the entire community as well. And it's it's about relationship and that, that willingness to allow individuals to share their voices to dialogue and to you know have open and honest discussions and to work through some of these challenging things that that's exactly what we do here in Cherry Hill we um, we communicate uh, openly and honestly with our community and 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 work through individual situations with individuals um, that's 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 what's been successful for us in the past and we anticipate doing the same and moving forward let me last one for you and, and uh, David, I'm going to ask you this, uh, or, you know, some worries that, that there are not going to be enough teachers um, or that there is going to be some certainly pressure on, on the teaching staff. Are you confident that your folks are all coming back or, you know, you're, that's not going to be an issue for you? Yeah, I think I, I think our people, I, you know what, so my, my faculty here at, uh, at West and our staff here in Cherry Hill, um, I think, you know what, they They've demonstrated the ability to rise to the occasion in the past. I think the best indicator for the future is what happens in the past. And in the past, they show up every time that they're uh, they're needed. They showed up this year, um, and I believe they will continue to show up for our students. So I don't worry about that too much, to be quite honest with you. I have I have the optimum amount of faith and, and confidence in, in the staff that we have here. Great, great staff members. David Adderhold, you have a whole district, K-12, or, or yeah. I imagine you've done some surveying of your staff on, on uh, you know, their, as well as your community on their comfort levels. You know, talk a little bit about that. It's basically, at least according to the governor, it's it's, it's all all in or not. Um, you know, and, and how do you how do you navigate that? So, so John, um, clearly uh, this year, parents being allowed to have some parental choice. Um, in WWP, we started out with about 70% of our families selecting a virtual option. Um, and we stayed that way up until about April. Um, as vaccines um, grew and availability grew uh, for the adults, we did see uh, more of a willingness uh, to return. And as students were starting to get vaccinated, we, we creeped up to about um, about. 45% um, in, in person, depending on grade level. But there are families that still are asking for a virtual option. And, and right now we've, we've stayed the party line that at this point, the, you know, the governor has said that virtual learning is not an option. Um, that's a hard pill to swallow for families that are concerned for one reason or another. A lot of it is fear-based. Um, some, um, some of it is absolutely medically based. Um, but fear-based can be medically based, right? And debilitating mental health concerns can be uh, a, a major health concern. So uh, I think we're going to need some guidance as, as a state around how we determine this, this idea of uh, what is a justifiable medical reason. Is it going to be just simply a doctor's note? Because we'll get lots of them as a state. Um, so what's going to be the type of uh, triggers that say that going to virtual instruction is allowed? 
is something that we're going to need some guideposts on. Um, and, you know, if we go to the CDC guidance, it does talk about medically fragile. So let's define what medically fragile means. Um, and that, that is something that the field could really use. Um, when it comes to uh, the staff, you know, the staff has done, across the state, has done an amazing, remarkable job. But that doesn't mean that we're not going to have shortages out there as a profession. And we're seeing tremendous evidence of that. Um, working with superintendent colleagues throughout uh, New Jersey and President Garden State Coalition of Schools, um, so working with over 100 districts in that, we are hearing constantly of, of shortages in, in, in the fields. And it used to be that um, it was shortages in some high, high needs area, like difficult to find a physics teacher, difficult to find a Calc A, B, or BC teacher. Um, we're having trouble finding everything right now. And there is a bidding war going on uh, between districts. So you can make an offer, go through a process, and then the, two days later, someone resigns. We never had that before. Um, so we are we are seeing tremendous shortages uh, across districts, across every field, but there are some high profile uh, uh, world language teachers, nurses, counselors, any, any anyone with a special ed certification, uh, mathemat mathematics, sciences, I mean, you name it, highly qualified status in special ed, family and consumer sciences, uh, almost everything but language arts and elementary teacher. I mean, it's, it's really significantly concerning out there. And there's been some bills that have been out there. The DOE has been, been um, advocating for some flexibility and opportunity to bring individuals in. Organizations like CJ Pride have been out there advocating. I believe Senator Ruiz had a bill out there that was also trying to get folks from out of state. But it is, it is concerning. It's going to be a growing problem. If you were a commissioner, um, David Adderhall, I'll stay with you on this one. Um, would you, what would your guidance be around masks and distancing with what you know now? Um, I mean, a lot of our questions are around masks and, and we knew that was gonna be the case because it's what it is. Um, and the governor was saying, we have some time to determine that. But if you are the commissioner, um, you know, or the governor, if you wanna be governor too, um, you know, what, what would you like to be the, the guidance, at least if, if, in terms of what we know now? John, in this one, I'm going to duck it by saying, assuming you mean the Commissioner of Health, because the Department of Ed will make no recommendation on this one. This is going to come from the, the health the health side of the house. Um, and and what I'd say is there's going to need to be, uh, in my sense, some reasonableness in, in thought about where our unvaccinated populations are. Uh, under 12 are not going to have access to vaccine. And we are, we're, you know, when we're talking about giving guidance for a public education system, we're going to have to be very mindful of the scope of our responsibilities. So my sense is there's probably going to be um, some flexibility granted in uh, with vaccinated populations and probably a higher standard for unvaccinated populations. Um, and I'm not sure if they're going to bifurcate it with with a with a K5, 6, 12 type of mindset. Um, but somewhere there needs to be some kind of reasonableness because the new fight is masks. And ever since the governor uh, gave some flexibility around things like heat and safety, um, it's been an outright war in schools um, to try to uphold mask mandates. Um, and so my sense is um, if we ever have to go back to full masking, um, districts are gonna really struggle uh, on, the, on the behavioral compliance side of the house um, because of some of, the, some of the processes that have been put in place. How do you? Uh, I'll go to the assistant commissioner. I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to promote you to commissioner quite yet. Um, and I know this is not your. Um, you know, this is as as David mentioned, uh, Department of Health as well as other parts of the Department of Education. But this uh, this notion of, you know, there there have been these tensions over vaccines and over masks and and you know how do you, you know, as as providing guidance as a whole, how do you sort of address some of those tensions that are out there um, on the instructional side, on the operation side, not a mask or no mask question, but, you know, it's, it, it, you know, it's complicated. Um, and, you know, from the state's point of view and putting out these, you know, this guidance that people are very anxious to see, um, you know, how do you manage all those things? Uh, John, you said it, it's complicated. Um, certainly, as the Assistant Commissioner for the Division of Academics and Performance, this is uh, not within my purview, but what I would say is that 
Um, I echo the governor's sentiment that the overarching goal is the safe return of staff and students to in-person instruction, uh, but we do know that the decisions that are made um, around health and safety are not uh, made in a vacuum and certainly not solely by the DOE, but guided by our medical experts and our sister agency and the Department of Health, as uh, David had said, and, um, and, and guided by science and data. So um, we focus in the Department of Education and especially in the Division of Academics and Performance on within those parameters and within that hopeful optimism that we are going to be safely returned to school in person, what are we doing to support students and educators um, in, in, in that setting? Certainly, certainly recognizing the frustration out there um, is important and, and we're well aware of that and have been listening very closely to our stakeholders, uh, meeting frequently and listening to these concerns. But it is, as you sta started and sa stated very succinctly, it's complicated. Because you're, um, and I'll ask the you know, two folks in buildings, um, are your buildings ready for full capacity you know, potentially three or six feet distancing. I'm going to go to Chantel in your classroom. Can you fit everybody in your classroom um, with with some of these distancing ideas? Or you know, not is there no, room? Not six feet apart. A, a colleague and I were just discussing that today. We were like, well, how are we going to fit 20? I have class sizes of 22, 23, and 24. I don't know. No, I it, no, you I don't. I don't see it. And I'm not a math teacher, you, but I know logistically is just yeah. not fitting. <laughs> <laughs> can, you fit him, can, you fit him, can you fit them with three foot distancing, Chantel? Is there enough even room for that, or uh, that's a that's going to be tight as well. So I don't know how they're doing it as far. You know, I don't know what my district is doing as far as uh, class sizes. Uh, right now we're doing class lists, and so far the class lists still remain 23, 24, 20, So right. you know. Things are, you know, subjected to change over the summer, perhaps, but it'd be interesting to see. Because your, 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 your previous configuration was a grouping tables together or that kind of thing. At sixth grade, it's somewhere in between. But but that kind of grouping of tables probably will not fit under the criteria from what I can tell. Exactly. Right? Yep, exactly. Yep. Nope. And the high school principal, you got room in that place for, uh, for full capacity? I don't know if we have room for full capacity, to be quite honest with you. I mean, if, if each of our classes at full capacity, uh, I know for a fact we would not be able to socially distance at six feet. Three feet would be a major stretch. Uh, some rooms are a bit larger than others and, you know, bodes itself better to uh, socially distance. But uh, as Dr. Adderall brought up, you know, many of the points he brought up previously about masking and vaccination, those are those are huge questions and issues for us. Um, huge questions and issues for us, you know, and, and, and at this point, we are anticipating a full return of our students. Um, we'll have to do the best we can, to be quite honest. Going back to my experience in high school, um, but those are, are pretty wild and, and, as I said, anxious uh, years for students. You've gotten a taste of um, you know their their mental health and their their social and emotional state. Uh, you know over the last year with with your mix of, of instruction in the building and not. What is you know from an educator's point of view? What is the state of our students' mental health right now? And what do you think it's going to be like in the fall? I mean, is, we've all given a lot of attention to the need for for helping these kids through this. You know what? How bad is it? Or you know how good is it? Speak a little bit to that. Yeah, I, th I think this has been a, a, an emotionally draining time. You know, it's been emotionally taxing for our students. Some of, some of the things that our kids have had to grapple with and to see happening across our country, uh, aside from just COVID, but you know, if we think about the civil unrest that that has occurred, uh, it's it, it's been a lot. It's been a lot to endure. It's been a lot to uh, to take in take in for our kids. And you know, we've attempted to um, engage our kids by speaking with them, allowing them to dialogue and express their their thoughts, emotions, concerns. Um, you know, we have staff members, uh, guidance counselors, student advocates, uh, student assistance counselors, you know, it's like an all hands on deck type of approach to, uh, to you know, to working with our students and giving them an opportunity to vent and express. 
um, and work through some of these some of these concerns they have. I do I do think that there will be mental health concerns that we need to deal with next year. We're anticipating it. We're planning for that, and uh, you know, trying to put staffing and resources in place now um, in anticipation for that in the fall. That was one of the questions I'll go to the superintendent on this. Uh, are there enough counselors out there uh, and professionals? It's a, um, it, it was a strained profession in the past where, you know, each counselor has hundreds and hundreds of kids, um, you know, within their, their uh, umbrella. You know, is, are there the, the resources and the, and the bodies to provide these mental health services? But well, John, and it's it's much bigger than just the the what the supports the districts have. It it goes to the mental health profession, the greater mental health professions, uh, psychologists, social workers, the availability of resources, the uh, students that need hospitalization placement, the availability of um, beds in facilities that work with youth and teenagers. Um, the the waiting lists can be can be over thirty days right now. Um, there's an, especially in Central and South Jersey, South Jersey in particular has a, hum, a tremendous shortage uh, in, in rural Northwest, um, tremendous shortages in availability of mental health supports. Uh, counselors have waiting lists now. So there, this has been a drain that's long before the pandemic, something that we've spoken about and advocated for years. And the reality is it's, it's just been uh, exasperated at this time. As far as guidance counselors, if, if districts wanted to, it's like nursing right now. We've had a tremendous nursing shortage for years. The way you, you get a nurse is you often um, outbid someone else or steal someone else's nurse for a higher pay grade uh, with a different salary guide. And so we know that there's tremendous, if you look within the pipeline of nurses and guidance counselors, school psychologists and whatnot, they, there's just not enough for the need. And for districts that have tried to work with organizations such as U University Behavioral Health Center out of uh, Rutgers University and other organizations like that, um, if you bring on um, therapists that work in your school communities, right now there's a tremendous gap for, for those fields as well, being able to staff up and hire to meet the demands of districts. Yeah, from the department's point of view, um, you know, this this is something that obviously the governor spoke about, and I know your uh, commissioner has as well, Lisa. You know, talk a little bit about, you know, what the, the department can do to help this pipeline, uh, as well as, you know, provide the services that a lot of these kids are gonna need. Absolutely, John. And um, David, you articulated that perfectly. Um, the shortages that were in place already are now just exacerbated by the drain from the pandemic. And it's a complex situation, but one that we certainly are actively engaging in conversations around potential flexibilities, looking at proposed legislation um, in the pipeline that explores, again, flexibilities around certain teacher certifications. We tried to provide certain flexibilities around school nurses and other teaching certifications and um, uh, standard certifications uh, as well during the pandemic. But we have to think long term uh, about a fix for this, not just short term, uh, because the short term fixes are exactly that. Um, outbidding another district for a nurse or a counselor uh, may solve for one and create a huge void for another. So um, as the department works, we have a, a, a one program office completely dedicated to recruitment and preparation, um, certification of teachers. We're looking at uh, regulatory packages that explore um, increased teacher endorsements, uh, ed prep programs that address um, teacher, or I'm sorry, shortages in high need areas, such as um, what David had mentioned earlier around physics and chemistry. Um, and so these are, are, are issues that we are actively discussing in the department and um, openly looking at ways to uh, address those shortages. And the numbers are real. Yeah, and I, I we got a, just got a comment from someone in the audience saying, you know, the strains on the on the private, uh, you know, healthcare industry is also very real. So we ran out of time. Um, you know, there are a lot of topics that I uh, that I hope to further uh, discuss going forward. Certainly, as we get closer to the year, uh, we only touched on uh, special needs population and, and our special education uh, system, which obviously is going to face its own, um, you know, challenges going forward. So we're going to uh, hopefully get some of you or all of you back to talk about that as we can get closer to the year. But I'd like to end it with um, going around the room, giving you each an opportunity 
sort of what is the one takeaway that you want to get across to uh, the audience, a lot of them educators and, and very involved, you know, advice for planning for next year. Uh, the one uh, twist in this lightning round system is you can't repeat what somebody said before you. Um, so I will start with the uh, assistant commissioner, Lisa. You know, what, what's one lesson you, you hope to get across today? Uh, well, I would say we can unequivocally say this has been a time like no other, but I believe the old adage that in all crisis lies opportunities, and uh, those opportunities lie in the lessons we've learned from uh, this situation. Perseverance, determination, new ways to think about teaching and learning, and I would say particularly with regard to instructional technology, we've had amazing educators and students and parents and caregivers who've partnered with our teachers over the past year, and we We've seen the power of community and the power of technology to break down the walls between classrooms and our homes. So I'm confident that we'll use those lessons learned and the opportunities to build a stronger educational system for our students and to address learning gaps and the persistent and historic learning gaps that we knew existed before uh, the pandemic and to really meet the unique needs of our students in meaningful ways. So thank you, John. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, David Adderhall from the superintendent's chair. Uh, what would you like to get across to our audience? Uh, John, I guess I'd, I'd say that um, I've just been tremendously inspired this year by by our educators, by our administrators, and by our, by our teachers in particular. Um, and that as we head into next year, that, that idea, and the, I'm gonna hold on to is that, that no significant learning occurs without a significant relationship. And that importance of making sure that we're supporting our staff as they step into the next year, foster those relationships and support them um, in the return with their students. Great, well, thank you very much for joining us, uh, David. Appreciate it. Uh, Kwame, from the principal's chair, uh, you know, what would you like to get across in terms of your thinking, closing out this year and starting to prepare for the next? Yeah, I think we have a tremendous opportunity to uh, to ensure that our uh, our school communities are uh, uh, school communities where equity is is actionable, where uh, no child is invisible, where every child is seen. You know, we we have um, great opportunity to create uh, accepting environments um, that acknowledges all of our our children to ensure that there aren't disproportional results that. Um, that you know that that exist, uh, where the school to prison pipelines are offset, and where we have communities that are restorative in nature that feature compassion and empathy. That's that's what we're looking to build here in Cherry Hill, and you know I, I hope that we're able to do that across the state as well. Thank you very much for Thank joining you. us. I appreciate it. And uh, Chantel, we'll let you close. I'm sure those are uh, all your dreams for your classroom and in Trenton as well, what would you like to leave our audience with? So as I open up and, um, you know, start my new year with my newly charged superpowers, I hope all educators, you know, return to school with whatever they're supercharged with and look each student in the eye, you know, and say to them that they were born to win and that victory is their only option. There you go. Definitely a, a good way to end it. Um, I want to thank all the panelists for joining us and, and also the audience as well. Uh, as I mentioned, we are going to continue keeping the chat room open and I will be jumping over there uh, to take any uh, questions. I believe uh, Chantelle Wooten will also be joining us if she has a few minutes. Uh, thank you for doing that. And I've invited a couple other guests, but please stay on if you want to keep this conversation going for a little bit longer. Uh, but again, thank you to the panelists and uh, Good luck uh, over the summer and in getting ready for this. You all deserve a much uh, well-deserved rest that you probably won't be getting because of this year. But that's, uh, as, we, as we've said, this is a year like no other. But thank you very much for joining us and uh, have a good rest of the week.